Well, a very good day to you. Uh, good to have you tuned in. This is Take Two with Jerry and Debbie and you getting underway on a Friday, not just any Friday, the first Friday of the month and a glorious feast day in the church. I'm Jerry Usher along with Debbie Giorgiani. Good to have you tuned in and we look forward to having you part of our conversation today. Hi, Deb. Uh, hello, Jerry. I have been looking forward to the show. I love the first Friday. I love talking about the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith. We do have a homework assignment for you this weekend, so be listening up. Stay tuned in the entire hour. It is our show on uh, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, so please call in. Any experience of the Eucharist, understanding, any questions, please call in at 833 288 Three nine eight six, and it is the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, uh, formerly known as uh, the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. I love this day, and this is just an amazing, um, uh, wonderful feast day to really go deeper about the Rosary, and we're going to tie it right into the Most Holy Eucharist, which is our show today, The Real Presence. So dial in 833-288-3986. And if you hear that raspy voice that I have, it's because I've been on the air for four hours on the uh, final day of the pledge drive for the Station of the Cross. And so we are pushing hard to finish a five-day pledge drive. So if your local listening area is coming to you right now, because there's pledge drives all around the country, please give generously. I learned so much from the speakers and the hosts and the programs this week on the pledge drive, Jerry, because you, you know, you listen on your time off from being um, on being a host of the pledge drive, you listen to the programs. And I was like, wow, this is good stuff. <laughs> it really is. We yeah. are so blessed. We are so very, very blessed. And thanks to EWTN and the generosity of Mother Angelica and all who have followed her, they offer their programming free of charge to Catholic radio stations. So uh, when you when you consider uh, supporting your local station, what you're re- all you, all they really need to do is raise the money for the brick and mortar buildings and the power bills and the postage and a few modest salaries. They're save EWTN has saved stations probably by now billions of dollars in programming costs. So what a great relationship it is, but please do be generous. Debbie and I have been on the Station of the Cross Catholic uh, Media Network during their fund drive, their appeal, which ends today. So be generous there, folks, and wherever you are, if EWTN reaches out to you, if your local station or network does, please, it's, 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 it's not a time to pull back. It's a time to be even more generous than ever before. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so dial in so we can uh, really make this first Friday very meaningful. All of heaven is watching. So call in and talk about the Most Holy Eucharist, 833-288-3986. Okay, Jerry and I will not make you wait for your homework assignment. Here it is for the weekend. Gather the family together and either go online or pull your Catechism of the Catholic Church off the shelf and uh, go to part two, the celebration of the Christian mystery, section two, the seven sacraments of the church, chapter one, the sacraments of Christian initiation, and go to article three, the sacrament of the Eucharist. It starts on paragraph 1322, 1322, and start reading. You will love it. It's amazing. And if you're not Catholic, go online and just type in the Eucharist CCC, capital CCC, and it will come right up and you'll get the sections of 1322. Um, and 1322, uh, each paragraph, Jerry, they're like three or four sentences. So you're talking maybe 20 minutes and you'll learn so much about the most holy Eucharist. All right, please do join us in our conversation here. You are the ones who drive the show every day. And we love to talk about the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist with you at 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986. Sure, we can get into the uh, the theology of it, the scripture behind it, uh, the historical realities and teachings of the church. We also want to just hear, you know, about your lived experiences you know, uh, how do you prepare to receive the Eucharist? Do you have any set prayers that you pray as a thanksgiving? How does receiving the Eucharist really maybe change your mood, maybe change your whole day if you go to morning Mass or on the weekends? Um, do you go to Eucharistic adoration? You know, if so, how often? You have the opportunity every day on this show to inspire and edify other people and give them 
the ideas, the tools that they need to really, um, I think, uh, tweak and upgrade their own spiritual lives and love of the Eucharist. So please don't sit this one out. Call in. As Debbie says, don't get started with your weekend yet. Call 833-288-3986. I like the way you think, Jerry. That's exactly what I was about to say. Don't get started with your weekend yet. Come on, you guys. Let's talk about the Most Holy Eucharist. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, sadly, you walked away from the Eucharist. You walked away from the Catholic Church. Can we talk about it? Is there a chance you will revisit it after you hear the testimonies coming in of people who really Um, absolutely embrace and understand and love and cherish the Most Holy Eucharist. The Stay With Me Lord Prayer by Padre Pio, a fabulous prayer. That's another homework assignment. Look it up. We've actually posted it on our website. Ace McKay, our wonderful producer, did at take2show.com. We also have a prayer online, uh, prayer kind of, um, you know, uh, you can post online there for our, our prayer book now. What happens is, is you post there, Ace McKay retrieves it, he gets it over to us, and we put it in the manual prayer books, because I know you guys like when we keep these books that we take with us anytime we go to shrines or any type of pilgrimages, or we ask other people to pray for the Take Two family. So you can leave your prayer request there, too, at taketwoshow.com. You can also um, see what's where we're at with different pledge drives, what's cooking with everything, and you can also visit us at standtalltoday.com. Stand tall today.com. We have a growing list of life coaches. Great, a growing list. Yeah, we do. Of life coaches. And um, you can get a free consultation. Okay, so I would I'm just so proud of myself that I didn't give the pledge drive number. So let me give the show number 833-288-3986. It's Friday, folks. And uh, it's Friday, and we're talking about the Eucharist, and I love that. Wow. Great show. I look forward to this show every single month, I have to tell you. Well, we committed at the start of 2022 to doing a show on the Eucharist, The True Presence, every first Friday of the month. We hope that you are able to go to Mass today. It's a, it's a double uh, double blessing today, Feast of Our Lady of the Most Holy Rosary as well. So mm-hmm. please get to Mass if you can. But before you do anything else, call us and join us on the program at 833 833- 288-3986, your love of the Eucharist, your devotion to it, how you adore Jesus, how do you teach your kids the real presence of Jesus, to receive communion reverently, do you get together as a family and have any uh, prayer rituals or things that you go through, 833-288-3986. The doctor is in. EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Open line Thursday. The Sunrise Morning Show. No one does Catholic radio like EWTN. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN radio. This is Father Joseph Mary. On this week's Mother Angelica Answering the Call, Mother reminds the audience that she is not here to win friends and influence people. Also, Mother discusses how no woman is ridiculed as much as Mary. Mother Angelica answering the call Sunday afternoon, 2 Eastern on EWTN Radio. Want to be notified when Take Two with Jerry and Debbie goes live on Facebook? Follow EWTN Radio's Facebook page and click on the bell icon to be notified. He was a doctor of the church and one of the greatest defenders of Christ's divinity. Matthew Bunsen and the doctors of the church. And Athanasius of Alexandria fought against the Arian heresy that questioned the divinity of Christ. He once condemned the Arians as opposers of Christ who had dug a pit of ungodliness. It was said of him, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world, but for Christ. He died in 373. For more about the doctors of the church, visit doctorsofthechurch.com. All right, here with Take Two with Jerry and Debbie and you on EWTN Radio as we talk about the Holy Eucharist today, Jesus' true presence in the Blessed Sacrament. If you've got thoughts on that, uh, maybe some 
some uh, some memories of, of having received the Eucharist, if, if Jesus has you know, touched you in a very special way, those are stories we really love to hear about. 87, no, 833, there I went, Debbie, 833-288-3986. Real quickly, before we go to the phones, EWTN Religious Catalog has, appropriately enough today, a uh, statue of Our Lady of the Rosary. It's nine inches tall, and it uh, depicts Our Lady holding the child Jesus in her left arm along with a rosary. And in her right hand is a scepter because she is queen of heaven. Mary and Jesus are both wearing ornate gold crowns, and Jesus is holding on to the rosary with his left hand and has a lily in his right hand. This piece is made of a plaster resin mix and is hand-painted with gold trim and accents. Again, it's nine inches tall. It's available at EWTNRC.com. You get free standard shipping for online orders, $75 or more, in the continental United States only if you just use the code FREE at checkout. So please do get yourself one of those Our Lady of the Rosary 9-inch statues, EWTNRC.com. Okay, I wanted to also bring up for the discussion... um, the fact that I absolutely love there are many there are many reasons why I love John Paul II. He's such a great saint, an amazing pope he was, and um, but he introduced us to um, the luminous mysteries, the mysteries of light, and the fifth mystery, um, the institution of the Eucharist, is my all-time favorite of all the mysteries. I just love. I'm so happy uh, that he had the the Holy Spirit. Um, prompting to do the the luminous mysteries for all of us because to meditate on the ministry life of Jesus is very, very important to me because it speaks very, very near and dear to my heart. And the institution of the Eucharist, the fifth mystery, I love. Now, I will tell you, there are some people I know that haven't really embraced the luminous mysteries, uh, but uh, Thursday, I, I can't wait to pray the rosary on Thursdays. I love the mysteries of light. How about you, Jerry? I do, too. Yeah, I have a deep, deep love for the Eucharist. So, yeah, the institution of the Eucharist, fifth luminous mystery, definitely is one of my favorites as well. In fact, I mean, when you think of all of them, they're all just so beautiful, and they help us meditate on the life and ministry and passion and death and resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, there is definitely something special about that fifth luminous mystery for me as well. Right. So, and today is the feast of of Our Lady of the Rosary. And please, if you would like to talk about uh, the mysteries of the Rosary, feel feel free to do so by calling eight three three two eight eight three nine eight six. I love Our Lady of Victory. I love that title. Okay, let's hear what Dwayne has to say. Uh, Dwayne is in Orlando, Florida. Sirius XM one thirty is the way Dwayne's listening. Hello, welcome to Take Two, our Real Presence show. Hello, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, question is, it feels like today um, more and more Catholics are believing that the actual body and blood of Christ are not present in the Eucharist. Um, I guess my question is this. King David says in Psalms, if I go to hell, I cannot escape your presence. If I go to heaven, I can't escape your presence. You are with me wherever I am. So how does Christ become more present in the Eucharist than he already is. So Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God are with us already. So how does he become more present through the Eucharist? Well, Dwayne, this is a, it, it does make sense, and I had never really pondered this question before. It's a very insightful question. And, and I would say, first of all, I, w- I would echo what you said. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And I don't know, I don't know if, you know, and I'm not a a theologian on on a par with, you know, the folks at EWTN or or Catholic Answers, but I would say I don't know that God is more present in the Eucharist than he is anywhere else. He's present in a different way. Um, He is present in, in, I've I've heard, I've heard people say it's not so much a a physical presence, but a, help me out here, Debbie, it's a, Sub, sub, about the Eucharist? It, yes, substantial in, in presence. Substantial, yeah, it's, it's, right. So it's the body and blood of blood, Jesus. soul, and divinity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dwayne, you know, Jesus took on our, our human flesh, and it is his true flesh and his true blood that we eat and drink. So it's, it's definitely a presence of a different kind, whether we can say it's, a, you know, it's more present in the Eucharist and than, than he is you know, anywhere else in the universe. I, I just don't know if that would be right to say that. Debbie, what do you think? Mm-hmm. 
Well, you know, I, I agree with Jerry, Dwayne. I, I wouldn't rank us up there with the Dr. David Anders or Colin Donovan or Jimmy Aiken or any of the folks that, that uh, really answer these questions on a regular basis. I can tell you from a religious education standpoint, we, we stress the fact that um, – in, in the most holy Eucharist, Jesus is fully present, uh, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so the idea of actually uh, taking um, him into our bodies and actually, you know, and I believe it's the scripture that says to, to gnaw, I believe. I think the scripture says to gnaw on it. So to, to actually chew and to swallow and to have him be part of our being is a very unique and, and substantial and very very powerful way. I think it shows the intimacy that God and that God wants with us because we are creatures that have to function with all of our, you know, um, senses, right? We, we do everything. Uh, that's how we function, right? We, 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 we touch and taste and feel, you know, we do all of that, all of our senses. And so it was this, it's, it's this very, you know, incredible intimacy. And I've often heard it said, you know, that the angels, you know, they, they don't get jealous, right? The angel, the, the good angels do not get jealous at all because they're beholding the face of God. But if they could have any type of envy in them, it would be the fact that we can actually take the body and blood into our being. We can actually um, you know, bring him deeply inside of us. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I can tell you from a religious education standpoint, that's how we um, explain it to everyone in our CIA and, and, in, and in sacrament prep. What do you think, Dwayne? Well, I, I was just curious. Um, I thought I've heard that it heard it explained that you really um, can't more deeply experience the presence of Christ than taking the Eucharist. But then I was thinking, as I explained, that if Christ is with me all the time, I can't escape his presence. Then it was just, it was a little um, perplexing. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and let's keep in mind, following up on what Debbie was saying, you know, there's a lot of nuptial imagery involved in the church and Christ, you know, the bride, the bridegroom, and in the Eucharist, you know, we are the bride of Christ, and Jesus, in a sense, we, we kind of, you know, substantially, by taking in his, his flesh and his blood, you know, mm -hmm. we, are, we are consummating that, uh, that marital, that nuptial relationship mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. have with it's him. It's an intimacy, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know, Duane, if mm -hmm. it's an either or, maybe it's a both and. Would you, would you be willing to settle for that? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mm -hmm. get that. It, it sort of makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny, Dwayne, because here's how I look at things, because I always relate it to food because I'm, you know, raised Italian. We're always centered around big meals. Right. So if you see a plate of lasagna in front of you, OK, and you abs you're looking at it and you can smell it and you start to think about what it tastes like. Right. But once you actually dive in and taste that lasagna and you bring it and you bring it into your body. Right. It has a whole different um, uh, dimension. Right. So the, it's very interesting. I, I and I and I, I I've always found it fascinating how at the at the Passover, at the Last Supper, Jesus used bread. Right. And, and actually, um, you know, God, God commanded the bread to obey. And it did. We heard Mother Miriam say that a long time ago. I loved that. It's always stuck with me. And so the simplest things that 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 bring us sustenance. And so that bread then is the body and blood, soul and divinity. And we take him into our being. I, that thought of that is just so God when you think about it, Dwayne, because if you can relate it to, to even just our regular meals, it makes a difference. There's a big difference of looking at a table set with, with a bunch of food and then sitting down and eating the actual food. What do you think? I agree. It, it makes a lot of sense. And um, I kind of wondered when you do take the Eucharist if um, I've always been on the fence. I know that the church teaches it's the actual blood and body of Christ, but, uh, and I understand that a lot of Catholics are starting to question that. So as I was reading Scripture and trying to wrap my mind around it, the, the question I posed just crossed my mind. So I was, yeah. mm -hmm. It's a great question. It's Absolutely. fabulous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dwayne. You've gotten us off to a great start today. 
And uh, that is something I'm sure that many of us will continue to ponder and reflect and pray about for further, uh, you know, Holy Spirit clarification mm -hmm. on that. Right. May I make a comment on that, what Dwayne said? Sure. Because he said as people are, are losing their, their understanding or their belief in, in the Eucharist, may I, I have an I have a idea about this, a thought about it. I think because it is so uh, basic and simple that I think we as human beings have a hard time really wrapping our heads around it, that this, that this little piece of, of bread and, and, a, and a cup of wine could be the body and blood and soul and divinity of our Lord and Savior who died for us, our God, right? So we have this hard understanding of it, and we go, oh, that can't be right. That doesn't make sense. It's got to be something just, you know, a symbol. And you know what? But you have to remember that is our God, because that's how our God has always done things with us. And so it makes sense. It makes complete sense if you really understand more about our God when you get into Scripture and you really read the Catechism. That's why it's so important that we dive into Scripture and constantly refresh our minds with the Catechism, Jerry. Well, and, and just real quickly, before we go to Frank, you, you mentioned uh, the word in John 6 is, is when, when Jesus says eat, the Greek word actually is gnaw. It really is means to, to, to take and to gnaw upon his flesh and the word for flesh is sarx which which means true flesh as well so john 6 is indisputably about the eucharist and mm -hmm. sadly enough it's also the only place in scripture where jesus followers left him over a doctrinal teaching mm -hmm. so it's tragic it is eternally tragic potentially for some people that they're losing their faith in the real presence of the eucharist but it cannot be denied and it's not you know there's nothing new under the sun as they say jesus mm -hmm. himself experienced this so we need to pray for those who have either never come to faith in the eucharist or lost that faith that's right that's right. But I love how we learned that uh, a while back on one of the pledge drives where Mother Miriam said, you know, that God commanded the bread to, o to mm -hmm. obey and the bread did, you know, mm -hmm. the bread obeyed. Right. Isn't that yeah. amazing? I love that concept. OK, so we're going to Frank next in uh, Louisiana on Sirius XM 130. Hello, Frank. Welcome to Take Two. Thank you. Hello, Jerry and Debbie. And uh, great program to be focused on the Eucharist uh, one day a month. I appreciate yeah, you doing that. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, my question is, why don't we hear more about uh, miracles of the Eucharist? There are books written, whole books, on just that topic, just miracles of the Eucharist, mm -hmm. so, you know, not, not counting all of the uh, theological books that are written mm -hmm. and so forth, just on the miracles. And I, I don't seem to hear much about that from right. the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you yeah. want to go ahead? I, yeah, I mean, well, I, 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 I'm... I, I'm big on this too. Go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> I'll just be brief, Debbie. I, I would say there are two, two kind of two parts to what I would say to that, Frank. One, yeah, it's 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 so, it's sad that we don't hear more about it from the pulpit. I fortunately I have a priest who not only preaches on them but has experienced a Eucharistic miracle uh, when he was saying mass. So he's very very moved by the, the Eucharistic miracles. But why we don't hear more about them, you know, from the pulpit in the church, um, you know, on on religious programs and stuff. That's really unfortunate because these are such amazing. Uh, interventions by God to bolster our faith in the real presence. The other uh, side of that coin would be, why don't we hear more about it from the world? Well, of course, you know, the nightly news is not going to report on Eucharistic miracles. They don't have any interest in, in promoting the faith or keeping people Christian or anything like that. So it's kind of a two-pronged thing for me. But in the church, yes, I really wish we would hear more about them. And Debbie, I know like you said, you're just huge on Eucharistic miracles. Oh, big time. So, Frank, you're absolutely correct. Okay, so Joan Carol Cruz, the late Joan Carol Cruz, wrote the book Eucharist, or put together the book Eucharistic Miracles, did a fine job on it. She also did The Incorruptibles and also Angels and, and, and uh, Devils, of great books. Um, and so... Uh, and then you had the uh, the young, uh, our wonderful young, blessed Carlo Acutis, uh, the young boy who died in his teenage years, who put together the exhibit that was approved by the Vatican of Eucharistic miracles, because he always said that the the Eucharist is is his highway to heaven. Okay, so he recognized that we needed to hear it. This is another thought I've had, Frank, and I've spoken to my brother about this. 
I think it's just human nature to constantly forget. That's why I think we need to remind each other. Why do I say this, Frank? Is because I teach all the time on guardian angels. And I can't even begin to tell you how many times I start the presentation and I'll say to the to the group that is gathering, how many of you thought about your guardian angel this morning? And only one or two hands go up. Why is that? It's a it's a truth of our faith. Okay, we believe in the guardian angels and we believe that each person has a guardian angel. Why is it so easy to forget about a guardian angel? Because I I think it's human nature. And remember that the demons constantly are implanting other thoughts and memories and images in our head. So if we have those things coming in, we, we tend to not meditate on the, on the truths as much, right? So it's important that we constantly remind each other, constantly. So you're doing this for us right now by asking this question about Eucharistic miracles. It gets us all to think about Eucharistic miracles. Hopefully after the show, people will go and read about Eucharistic miracles. And it's it's, it's incredible. So we have to support each other on that. And look what the pandemic did. Let me just say one, one quick thing. Look what the pandemic did. It separated us. It put us all on our own little islands, right? So we, there, was even, there was even less of a reinforcement of the truths of our faith. That's why we need to do it more now than ever. Frank, you, you hear the music. Hold on, because I just want to make sure you have some, maybe some last thoughts. That's the music. We're going to just hit the pause button. When we come back, more about the most holy Eucharist. Please join us, 833-288-3986. Church Pop features new online Christian content that's fun, informative, and inspirational. You'll learn something new every day. Find Church Pop on Snapchat, Instagram, and on the web at churchpop.com. Church Pop, make holy all things. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. What have you always wanted to know about the Vatican? Well, I'm your Vatican Insider, and I answer that question when I bring you the news about the Pope, Vatican City, and I share insights and stories from a broad spectrum of church ministries. Vatican Insider with Joan Lewis, Saturday night, 9 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, president of Life Issues Institute. Researchers at Durham University in England used 4D ultrasound to watch the faces of 100 unborn babies as their mothers ate food. When carrots were consumed, the babies had a happy face. But when mom ate kale, the babies looked sad or about to cry. A number of studies show babies can both taste and smell in the womb, the aromas being present in the amniotic fluid. Another study from the University of Virginia discovered behavioral traits were present in the womb, such as the inclination to cuddle or have perceptual sensitivity. Psalm 139 verse 13 says, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That is the literal truth of God's words to our ears. Like us on Facebook at Life Issues and stay informed, more informed than you've ever been. Hi, this is Dr. David Anders. Do you have questions about the Catholic faith? Get the answers on Call to Communion, coming up at 2 p.m. Eastern. Now, back to Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. All right, Take Two with Jerry and Debbie and you. It's first Friday. We talk about the beautiful, great gift which comes to us Really, our understanding and belief in it comes through faith alone, and then we nurture that faith through devotion to and reception of the Holy Eucharist, the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. We're talking with Frank in Louisiana. Frank, we offered a lot of thoughts there. I thought Debbie was on a beautiful roll there. Do you have any thoughts on what either of us shared or anything else come to your mind that you would like to share? Well, i just say that um, in John 6, as you were talking about, and Debbie was, um, you know, people were saying when as Jesus was uh, giving the uh, discourse, the people were saying, "Who can listen to this? This is this is craziness." A hard and they were leaving, and and, and Jesus just uh, you know he he doubled down and he turned to the other disciples and said, "Are you going to leave too?" I mean, mm-hmm. he didn't back off one iota. 
and 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 now God has deigned to prove to us that this truth through various miracles, many miracles, and we don't honor that His action by by espousing it, talking about it from the pulpit. It's it's one of the key things that makes us different from other Christian religions. Yeah, Sorry, it sure. I got no. No, it is the uh, defining characteristic and teaching and, and reality that, that separates Catholicism from, you know, most other, um, you know, uh, religions. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Eastern Orthodox, I believe, have valid sacraments and so forth. But when we're, we're talking about, you know, non, non-Catholic, uh, you know, evangelicals, Protestants and so forth, some who believe that they have the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, which, of course, is dependent on val- you know, succession of valid holy orders, so... Um, it is, it is, Debbie, it is our distinctive, distinctively Catholic reality mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. something we should shout from the rooftops. Mm-hmm. I agree with Frank. Uh, yeah, I mean, the evidence is there, Frank. You can go with the Eucharistic miracles, look at the Shroud of Turin, look at um, the fact that if you talk to exorcists who perform the solemn rite of exorcism, what do, what do they tell you? They tell you that the demons know, the demons know that the, the Eucharist is the body and blood and soul and divinity of our Lord and Savior. The demons know that the rosary is powerful. The demons know when the Blessed Mother comes into the room, they want to get get far away way because she is the the mother of god you know what frank we we have the evidence the problem is we just don't talk about it enough and the world is really much louder much louder than our than our church has been that's that's why i think that we need catholic radio and television now more than ever so thank god for ewtn and all the local affiliates that are doing the hard work because if we didn't have that frank can you imagine what people would be believing they'd be believing things all over the place i mean because nobody really reads that much anymore we we get things in little snippets so frank we've got to get back to a strong true message and and we can all um you know deepen our faith life and it'll be wonderful and, and the culture will change so we can go on and on about this frank but what do you think i think we're, we're all in agreement yeah i think we're in violent agreement here too i, I and god bless uh the both of you for what you're doing and, and the word that you're getting out. And so we just need to all join in, but it just mm-hmm. irritates me. And I, I, and I know I shouldn't be irritated at our clergy, but I do get irritated. Uh, fortunately, we have a, a, a pastor that does talk about the Eucharistic miracles and, and other miracles, uh, other evidences, physical evidences that uh, prove our faith. But mm-hmm. so many don't, and it, I know I shouldn't get aggravated, but I do. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, well, no, we it's, sh- I, I share in that too, Frank. I, you, I even go up to priests sometimes and I say, Father, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So I'm right with you, Frank. Uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Go ahead, Jerry. Well, I was going to say, I think it's a, a, a holy frustration, Frank. I, I, don't, I don't think you mean it in any critical way of our priests, like you would, like you would you know, hammer them if you had the chance to. It's just right. simply a desire, a holy desire that you have that kind of uh, gets pent up in there that, that we all probably share one time or another. Thank you, Frank, for your call. God bless you. I thought it was a great call. Yeah, you know, the paradox, Debbie, uh, of the thing is the world is starving. They just don't know what they're starving for. They're starving for the Eucharist. Uh, Absolutely. And they just don't know it. And I think to quote Mother Miriam again, I heard her one time say, really, uh, you know, Catholics with regard to the Eucharist, we're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You know, Mm -hmm. we and and let's face it, at every mass, there's a Eucharistic miracle. We shouldn't we shouldn't forget about that because right. mere bread and wine do not ch- naturally change into flesh and blood. They supernaturally do. That is a miracle at every mass. Amen to that. Well, let, you know, talking about local affiliates, let's do some cr- congratulations for those that are working so hard. We'd like to congratulate our longtime EWTN radio partner, Catholic Radio in South Carolina, on their listen to this, folks, 18th anniversary this week, 18 years. They're now heard on four signals throughout South Carolina in Greenville, Spartanburg, Greer, Greer, and Charleston, and Hilton Head. Oh, I love Hilton Head, South Carolina. Congratulations to Michael Brennan and his team at, at Catholic Radio in South Carolina, now celebrating 18 years with EWTN Radio. My parents almost moved to Hilton Head, South Carolina. Is that right? So yeah, you would have grown they, up there? 
I would have grown up there. I loved, I loved Hilton Head. Beautiful area. And Charleston, um, my brother went to uh, the Citadel in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Well, our uh, good friend and listener, Zach, emailed take2 at EWTN.com, reminded us that EWTN Television has a show called Explore with the Miracle Hunter on Saturdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time and Wednesdays at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time. So thank you, Zach, for that uh, very blessed reminder. 833-288-3986. What angle would you like to take on the Blessed Sacrament, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist? Doug has been holding patiently. Stand tall, Doug, in Blooming Prairie, Minnesota, listening on Sirius XM 130. Hi, Doug. Hi, guys. Yeah, say, uh, when you're, you're uh, urging us to study uh, paragraph 1322, uh, I, I kind of compared it to natural family planning, how when you're both so in touch with what's happening between you, yourselves, the husband and wife, you know, you, the husband becomes so in tune with uh, what's going on in, in his wife. And, and it, it, it's much more than just, you know, um, you know uh, sexual for recreation purposes because you, you just become much more aware and it becomes a much more deeper experience uh and i kind of related it to i mean the many times that i've called in i still get this sense of a little uh, nervousness or, or excitement about you know you're, you're talking to the world and and so it it, it never becomes just uh you know just wrote uh normal behavior it's always this mysterious excitement and and related to the eucharist i love that part of the mass where uh in the creed we say and by the power of the holy spirit he was born of the virgin mary and we're all asked to make a a bow because it's such a profound moment when divinity unites with humanity and 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 physical reality uh that that brings you to realize the profound interaction between a fetus and the mother i you know the more you study it i i've heard that they share dna with each other that the the child dna can help to heal infirmities in the mother there's such a profound unity between the fetus and the mother, and then and then uh, just the last thing, some some uh, you know get the theological thinking that if childbirth pain was a result of sin, then you know I think the church teaches that Mary somehow had a different experience at the physical birth of Christ, but spiritually. On the cross, when Christ was on the cross, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin, or at least the consequences of sin, so that we who are human could become like God. Well, I, I believe and have experienced in my heart, she did experience birthing pains on Calvary. She became our spiritual mother by entering in so deeply united with Jesus' sacrifice. The the birthing pains of her becoming our mother actually occurred. Yeah. Doug, you have said so many insightful things, and I'll just try and touch upon a couple of them, starting with what you just said. We remember at the present the Feast of the Presentation of the Infant Jesus in the Temple when the prophet Simeon said to Mary, you know, a sword shall pierce your heart as well. She who was without sin suffered intensely and immensely um, at many times during her life, but especially, you know, during the, the, the passion of our Lord. And like you said, you know, we, the church is born out of the, the side of Christ, the blood and water that came out. And so, yes, Mary became the spiritual mother of the church through much pain and sharing in her, her son's passion on the cross. And you talked about the mother and the child. 
you know, sharing the same, uh, you know, flesh or DNA, however you put it. I remember a professor in, in, at Steubenville, Franciscan University, one time made the uh, very insightful uh, point. He said, you know, in a secondary way, when we receive the body and blood of Jesus, secondarily, you know, because Mary and Jesus share the one flesh, and he came from her flesh, you know, we are receiving the body of Mary, too, in a certain kind of, uh, you know, real physical sense, but also a very spiritual sense as well. So, and what did they say? Debbie, you are what you eat, you know, and if we want to become more like Christ, we should definitely eat his flesh and drink his blood as often mm -hmm. as we can. Well, you both said some pretty profound things. And I just want to say, Doug, I love your spirituality. You, you think at angles that I think are, um, you know, with, with such intention and depth and you, you explore, but you go even deeper and deeper. And every time you call in, Doug, and you're right, you have a worldwide platform. You're sharing and you're teaching and we're learning and we're growing. And you know what? I believe all of heaven rejoices at that. And I believe all the demons get really frustrated and they're like, oh boy, that's not good. Doug did it again. He's, he's educating people on, on who God is. And I love that. And I just say, keep it up, Doug, because you have a depth to your spirituality that is, is incredible. One, one last uh, thing. Uh, somewhere, Augustine, I, I read that Augustine uh, gave the idea that Christ becoming, you know, receiving his humanity from her can be somewhat related to her taking this this food that is hard to to uh, digest, hard, hard for a child to digest, and she turns it into a holy milk that us as children can can ingest and uh, absorb, but that that's uh, that's way deep again. But it's, it's just good stuff to to just uh, re realize the profound experience that the Eucharist is. Yeah. Sure is, Doug. Well, God has gifted you. I agree with everything that Debbie said. You know, you've got a worldwide platform. This, this is what Take Two with Jerry and Debbie is all about, is, uh, you know, you, Doug, and all of the Take Two family sharing your beautiful uh, insights and lived experiences. And you have indeed been uh, teaching and edifying our global listenership today. So thanks again for doing that. We always love to hear from you. Don't be too long before you call again. Uh, Andy in Amarillo, listening on St. Valentine Radio, called, and he said, When I was a kid, the priest gave communion via intinction, which is mm -hmm. when they dip the host in the precious blood and then give you both at the same time. And Andy says, I wish we could get that back rather than only the priest receiving both species. Well, Debbie, I would, I would just maybe add a note to that. One of the reasons, you know, some parishes have not for a long time received under both species, but I know my parish, for example, is not right now just because of the aftermath of the COVID, and mm -hmm. that, that could come back someday. But right now, a lot of parishes are not uh, receiving under the precious blood because of, uh, you know, that was taken, that was eliminated during COVID for health safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you're receiving um, um, the host, uh, uh, it's the Eucharist, you are receiving both. So both, you can yeah. feel confident in that. And with intinction, I have to agree with Andy, though. I absolutely, I know our church doesn't, doesn't uh, do that. Um, but, are you, but I understand you have to, with intinction, you have to be very careful how it's done because it cannot be in any way, you can't drop any precious blood. So you have to have, what is it, the patent underneath each mm -hmm. um, uh, person that's receiving Holy Communion, so there, it's, it takes a much more, um, you know, precise, um, you know, distribution of of the Eucharist. You have to be very careful. Although I will tell you something, Andy, that was interesting. Last uh, week, I was at a mass and um, I noticed that the priest, the celebrant, did um, for the for the brother priest on the altar, did uh, actually have. They did it that by that way. Instead of uh, drinking from the chalice, they actually d um, did it in the form of intinction for both for the priests. I noticed that last week. It was kind of interesting. So, yeah, and I think in many of the Eastern churches they do they, they do they have the the cubes and they do it with a little spoon spoon yeah. like a little bird. You you lean back and it's, it's beautiful. I love Dropped it. Into and your they, mouth. And they yeah. they place it on yeah in your mouth. I love it. Yeah. I have to agree with you, Andy. I'd rather take time and really do it right and. And uh, really, um, you know, 
have everyone receive in just a really slow, reverent way. Um, Kathy in Windsor, Colorado, uh, Catholic Radio Network, you were on the line. You had a great comment. Can you call back, Kathy, real quickly? You you had a fabulous comment talking about um, um, God, Jesus hiding his his uh, divinity and his humanity, and the same, and then relating that to the Eucharist. I mm-hmm. thought that was brilliant. Um, but where are we going to go next? We have a lot of comments coming in, Jerry. So you decide. Well, we're going to get to uh, Jane here in just a moment, but I wanted to uh, tell people about another EWTN show first. Real quickly, Light of the East Radio, speaking of the Eastern Churches, Sunday mornings, 1130 Eastern Time on EWTN Radio. Father Thomas Loya, fantastic priest, wonderful host of this show. He and his guests explore the rights of the Eastern Catholic Churches in full communion with the Pope. And this week, the spirituality of the Eastern Christian churches, although ancient, influenced the writing of a contemporary science fiction book. Author Mary Woods will be with Father Loya to talk about her new book and the influence behind it. That's Light of the East Radio, Sunday mornings, 1130 Eastern, on many of these same EWTN radio stations. Okay, Kathy has called back, um, and she was waiting a a really long time, so hopefully we have her ready. Kathy, thank you so much for the invitation. Jane, hold on. We'll get to you. But Kathy in Windsor, uh, Colorado, Catholic Radio Network is the way you're listening. Please share your comment. I thought it was was so insightful. Well, I want to let Frank know that we have a pastor who speaks of the Eucharistic miracles and is just promoting Eucharistic adoration with our at our parish. And when I was at my time in adoration, and I was pondering, you know, how so many Catholics don't believe in the real presence, um, I needed something that was kind of concrete for me because I'm sort of science-based mind here. And, and it was brought to me, or I just kind of, it came to me that, you know, God made himself, his divinity came to us in our humanity, and he can also kind of hide his divinity in the accidents of the bread and wine. And I said, well, if he can do that in his humanity, he has to be there in in the, the host that we're receiving. So I just wanted to share that for people who might you know, be questioning that or for other people that, you know, had the same <laughs> insight or needed to have the same insight that I, that I got. I think it's brilliant. And when you think, when you even look at some Eucharistic miracles, Kathy, you can st- still see part of the host, but yet the heart muscle of, of our Lord and Savior is right there. So, so it's so fascinating how it emerges when the, when the actual Eucharistic miracle has happened. I think that I'm so glad you were able to call back quickly. What do you think, Jerry? Well, I think it's a, it's a very important, uh, point to make, Kathy, and, and thank you indeed for calling back. Uh, it, it's true, because, you know, when Jesus was walking the, the earth, he did veil his divinity in his humanity, and it would be like, you know, me walking around the neighborhood today saying, hey, everybody, I'm the Messiah, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, and people are going, yeah, right, uh-huh. And even his miracles didn't persuade some of the people, especially the religious leaders, you know, he would raise people from the dead and heal people and do all these amazing miracles. And, and, and most of the time they just got upset because it was done on the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. You know, it was almost like the miracle went right over their heads and mm-hmm. they just said, well, who are you to do things like this on the Sabbath? So you're right, Kathy. And St. Thomas Aquinas gives us his great, great hymns on the Eucharist. I'm sure you're familiar with those, Kathy, where he talks about, you know, when our faith supplies for our, our understanding of the Eucharist when our senses fail. And our senses are going to fail us because we're looking at a piece, what looks like a piece of bread and wine. You mentioned the accidents. That is the, the appearance, the shape, the color, the taste. The, the host and the wine retain all of those accidents, yet do become the body and blood of Jesus. So, Kathy, anything else you wanted to add on to that? No, I, that was my, basically my, my comment. Yeah. So hope you guys have a blessed, blessed day. Oh, and wanted to ask for some some prayers my it's my husband and I's 11th anniversary today so oh. and 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 we didn't even know at the time that we scheduled our our wedding on the feast of, of our lady of the rosary, rosary. and we've had yeah. so many 
miracles. Or, I mean, not miracles, but, well, we've had a couple, mm-hmm. but um, just blessings. I yeah. know Our Lady, Our, Our Lady brought us together. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kathy, your husband's first name for the book? Dennis. 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 Okay. Congratulations. Happy yeah. anniversary. Enjoy praying that rosary together as husband and wife. I love it. Kathy, thanks for calling back. You're a precious soul. We appreciate it. And we got, we, I, we promised Jane because Jane is a first time caller from El Paso, Texas on Sirius XM 130. We don't have a lot of time, Jane, but we wanted to squeeze you in and welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy about this um, topic because the Eucharist is my very, very favorite. Um, I just wanted to share two things. First, I, the Eucharist was really what brought me really back to the faith. I, for some reason, I just never was taught as a child that the soul, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And as soon as I understood that, I mean, mass has just never been the same. But um, when during COVID, we were blessed. Bishop Peter from Las Cruces, I'm in the Diocese of Las Cruces, he was the first bishop that opened up and allowed us to receive Holy Communion. And one time I was just crying to the Lord because of all the hand sanitizing, and I, all I could taste was the hand sanitizer. And our Lord just said, see, I'm just so humble that I'm going to come to you any way you can. And that just gave me such great comfort during COVID that... Um, that the Lord was willing to, to accept all of the crazy, you know, things that we were doing during COVID as long as we were willing to receive him. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. And um, thank you for this topic. Well, thank you, Jane. Yeah, it's great to hear personal testimonies like that. And yeah, I mean, I remember, we, we all remember very vividly the, uh, the, the church shutdowns and the lockdowns and the restrictions on the sacraments and all of that. Thanks be to God. You know, people are talking about all of that in past tense now, Debbie. I hope and pray that it is in past tense, that we don't see any other waves or new mm-hmm. variants or things like that that cause all that to happen again. Because how many people are still not going back to church and receiving the sacraments after mm-hmm. finding mm-hmm. it really, you know, comfy and cozy to do so on right. their couches, you right. know, with a cup of tea or something? I, I just want to issue this challenge since we issued a, a homework assignment for the weekend. If you, if uh, you are, you should be going to back to mass on the weekends, but try to go one day during the week, pick like Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday and go at least once a week. If you're not a daily mass goer, because it's, it's really a spiritual game changer. It really is. Um, we, do we have time for Madeline in Tennessee real fast, real fast. Real fast, you got about a minute, yeah, less than okay, a minute. Okay, in Memphis, Tennessee, I, I believe it's it's Madeline, is that correct? Welcome. Yes, it's Madeline, can you hear me? Yes, yes, real quick, thank you. Got about 30 okay. seconds. Well, at our parish, we are able to receive kneeling at the communion rail via intinction at our 10.30 wow. a.m. Sunday. Uh, he has the chow- He has the host with the with a circle around it where the precious blood is around that so he can dip right in that same. And then we have several servers. So we have the server holding the patent to um, make sure that none of the precious blood would ever be spilled. And we've been doing Mm -hmm. that. Our priest also, ever since COVID has started, does a sprinkling rite at the 1030 a.m. mass and goes Mm -hmm. throughout the church and blesses everyone before mass starts. Wow. That's incredible. I'm sure it's very reverent. I love communion rails. I love them. And I think that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing with us. We so appreciate it. God bless you for getting in there just in the nick of time. Sharon in California, could you please email us? You said something about religious education for high schoolers and how you taught them about the Eucharist. I would love to hear it. I know Jerry would as well because he teaches RCIA. So please email us. Take two at EWTN.com. Jerry? Yeah, and in Colorado, thank you for your email. I wish we had time to read it. It talks about your love of the Eucharist and the Rosary. And also, you said your sister chose this day as well, just like one of our uh, recent callers, uh, Feast of the Holy Rosary, to get married. But she and her husband are not practicing Catholics. So she, Anne, is asking for prayers, Debbie, for her, um, her sister and brother-in-law to come back to the teachings of the church. So thank you, Anne, for your email. 
And on Monday, we are asking uh, the youth, the young young folks, you've got to call in or you can represent your child and asking uh, what they think of the world they're growing up in. We want to know that on Monday. Until then, have a beautiful and blessed weekend. St. Joseph, please pray. For- One of the reasons we should go to Mass is because, if you look in the Catechism, you will see the fruits of Holy Communion. And these are